Hey everybody, welcome to the Dad Challenge Podcast. My name's Josh, and this is the video that I promised you guys at 100,000 subscribers. And I'm sorry it's taken me so long, but actually, it's not that I was like delaying it on purpose, I was actually doing a ton of research into my own story. A lot of people accuse me of not doing any research, so I thought I'd research my own story. And that says a lot, because my own story has a bunch of surprises that I didn't even know about until this past week and a half, so it's been quite crazy. So, my story is going to be multiple parts, obviously, but today we're going to focus in a little bit, kind of, my early life that I found out since, you know, this past month, reaching out to family I've never spoken to, people I didn't even know that I lived with, places I didn't even know I lived. It's very, very crazy. I'm really excited to share my story with you. Let's go. So a caveat and a trigger warning, okay? Um, if you are triggered by accounts of abuse, um, negligence, abandonment, everything from your own childhood, be really, really careful with these videos and my story because even myself, as I was going through these, there's a couple moments where I'm like, I can't tell people this stuff. I can't, I can't. Like just, it's not even because I don't want to, but, and I don't think it's a privacy issue. It's just that, holy crap. Some things you just realize when you're older shouldn't have happened to you as a kid. Like I'm not, I'm not even trying to laugh, but like, again, I've said this a bunch of times about my story and I'll continue to say this about my story. It's that that was my normal. Those of us who have grown up like I've grown up in poverty, um, on welfare, in abandonment, in abusive situations, uh, sexually assaulted, those types of things, um, that is our normal, right? And so when we're young, we actually don't realize that that's not normal, right? Because again, I don't, because we don't know what to, we don't know what to compare it against, right? And so again, I, I'm trigger warning this, be really careful because there's a lot of, in my past that I've dug up and I've, I've recently remembered that's just not okay for any kid to go through. But the reason I'm telling you my story first, because I promised I would, but also because I want to document the things that I've discovered because I have a terrible memory. And eventually I'd love my kids to watch my story and see the, pro the progress of my life and our history of our family, because it's really, really rich history. It's also really scary. And there's also a lot of good points. I'm not just going to sit here and sad fish all day long about what was me, my childhood, all that stuff, because I sit in a place of privilege right now more than I've ever had in my entire life. And I recognize that I'm no longer that person. And I didn't, I'm not going to allow the choices of my past and the hurt of my past to affect who I am going forward. And nor have I ever, I always made that choice to say, I'm not going to be that way. And that is something I tell people that that's my choice to make. A lot of people have been hurt in the past and that has shaped their future and it's not their fault. But I decided early at a young age, I wasn't gonna allow this, my past, what you're about to hear, shape who I was to become. And I didn't. And so this whole series is based, it's gonna be one big historical timeline about how many places I've lived and what has happened in those times that led me to where I am today, what made me me, the characters in my life that shaped me and all those kinds of things. Um, and, and again, I hope this will inspire others too, to, you know, understand that your past doesn't make who you are in the future. And it's going to be a, it's a, there's a story of faith in here. Big time church is going to be a big part of this story. Um, hurt is going to be a big part abandonment, abuse, love. There's going to be some amazing moments in here. I, I'm sure of it. That I'm gonna put, I'm gonna take you guys to church a couple of times because I think there's a lot of people on the internet that follow me specifically too that have gone through this, and have never had any closure. And I, I want to let you know that how lucky I know I am that I actually got closure before my mom died. A lot of people didn't get that. So, without further ado, we're gonna step in. It's going to be my ADHD brain, obviously, as always. You know, I've got my meds. We're good to go. Got my coffee. Probably shouldn't be drinking coffee with my meds, but that's that is what it is. Part of my story about the ADHD and ODD and everything else is going to be a part of this. A lot of you are going to see. I'm going to shape my childhood. A lot of you guys are going to see this in your children, right? Really, really interesting. The things that I've learned because I think in the end, yeah, that wasn't good, but at the same time, I learned a lot and it shaped me to who I am today. So there, I said it. Okay. So my name is Josh, and I was born in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada which is the 
electric, I call it the electric wheelchair capital of the world, to be honest. Have you ever been to Hamilton? Um, yeah, Hamilton is, and I'm allowed to say this because I'm Hamilton Hamiltonian native. Hamilton's gross. Some parts are nice and they are becoming gentrified and nicer again, but Hamilton's not cool. But I was born in the hospital called Henderson Hospital and just found out right now, I was looking this up, it's no longer called Henderson Hospital. It's called Juravansky Hospital and it's right on the mountain. If you can see here, let's see if the internet goes, this is the view of the hospital I was born from. This is Hamilton, everybody. You can see over here the smoke from the from the the steel mills and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, Hamilton is a very old city and very much. I don't like Hamilton, and I think a lot of my my likes and dislikes of things from, come from my childhood because I didn't have a good childhood. So take that with a grain of salt. I'm sure Hamilton's nice now. I don't. I would never live there again. But this is the hospital I was born in. Obviously, it's been updated since 1979. I'm older than the hills, two feet in the grave type of thing. Don't buy green bananas. But that's the hospital. I was born in. And it's interesting that this is where I was born because I reached out to some people that I didn't even know existed in my past. I'm not going to be saying any names because I just don't want to, right? I don't want people to know everything about names, but I did reach out to family and a lot of the family I didn't even know existed because my mom was adopted. And part of my story has to come back to who my mom was. Okay. Because I didn't even know who my mom was really until after she died. My mother kept her childhood very secret from us. She didn't tell us anything. And maybe there were some things in passing that we found out about, but not really, she would never get into it. My mom was a very secretive and private woman about her past and her hurts because she didn't, you know, I look back at it now and I realize maybe it's just because she didn't want us to see the trauma and hurt that she went through, didn't think it was our business or didn't want us to have that be a burden on us, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what it is, right? My mom was an enigma to me sometimes. The things that she did for us, the things that she kept from us, and the things that she went through are three different, makes her three different people to me. First of all, my sister sent me this picture, and this is a picture of my mom. Okay, on the left, that's her. That's a little bit older. That's about a year before she passed away, and that is her dad, and his name is Buzz. Okay, I'll tell you his name because that's his nickname. Buzz is Jamaican and I think Native Indian, if I'm correct, and this is my mom's biological sisters, and as you can tell, the indigenous, you know, blood runs really thick in our family. I looked back when I got my DNA done, I looked back and I found out that my great, great grandfather was a Mi'kmaq indigenous chief married into another indigenous princess's tribe. Like I'm royalty. I don't know if you guys knew that, but and that's really cool. Cause you can go into these timelines and you can figure out your family. And a lot of people put a lot of information in the records for our indigenous past have since burnt down in a church. And my family um, everybody involved here um, have always been searching for ways to prove our indigenous past. And um, when my mom was 27, we did indeed find it. And I'll get to that in a second. But that is my mom. Those are her sisters. And you can you can see there that uh, they're happy there. But my mom was adopted from birth, did not know her biological family until she was 27 years old. So here's some cool things I've discovered about my mom, whose name is Cheryl. My mom's name is not actually Cheryl. I found this out about six months ago. And interesting enough, here is another photo of my family, Buzz's family on his side, which Buzz is my grandfather. Yeah, Buzz is my biological grandfather. Although I grew up with another grandfather, Grampy Barber, and he has just recently passed away. And even though that's Buzz is my biological grandfather, I don't think I've ever met him in my life. And if I do, I have no recollection of it. But this is my grandfather, Weldon Barber who I know I grew up knowing as my grandfather and he's the adopted dad of my mom. And again, I didn't even really know my mom was adopted until later in life. So this was never, I never, we never knew we were never told any of these things, which is kind of crazy if you think back. Right. But this is Weldon's, this is uh, Buzz's side of the family. And I just wanted to show you this picture because a lot of people are um, questioning my, my sincerity on my heritage. Okay. My heritage is very, very mixed. And so I wanted to show you guys this picture because a lot of people question me about my uh, my ancestry and everything else. Um, but this is my grandfather's side of his family. Um, very, very deep, rich history that I had no idea about at all. Uh, my grandmother was French and Native Indian as well, Mi'kmaq. We all come from the East Coast, which is a Mi'kmaq tribe. Um, very, very rich in history. So I wanted to show you that picture because I wanted to let you guys know that, you know, I, I'm very, very mixed in my identity um, in, in the world. So I did a DNA test and this is what it came up with, which is really 
really interesting because it came up with things I didn't even know. So between nor I'm 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 86 percent European, including Northwestern European, British and Irish, 78 percent. I'm basically a Brit, right? Um, Scandinavian, 0.9%, broadly Northwestern European, I'm 1.9%, and then Southern European, 4.8%, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and then Sub-Saharan African, I am 13.7%. Um, and that comes from my, my grandfather's side. And, and so here, and then, so, and then Sub-Saharan African, 3.7%, West African, 12.9%, Ghana, uh, Liber Liberian, Sierra Le Leone, Leone? You know, I don't know, 7.2%, Nigerian 4.2%, and Broadway. And it, I, it'd actually be interesting to see if anybody has, if if 13.7% African heritage in my DNA actually means anything. I don't know. But I know that there is, oh, as far as the European and Western European, you will not see indigenous ancestry labeled in 23andMe or any of these DNA tests. In order to do that, you have to do what's called, uh, there's a test you can get in Canada. And it's, uh, I forget the name of it, but you have to do the test at a place and then they monitor it through the way I forget what it's called, like a, the process of something um, in order to get your DNA, your, 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 your indigenous ancestry locked in. So you can become, you know, you can get your status and status in Canada is a pretty big deal. If you can get status as a native Indian in Canada, I mean, school's free. You can pay you less tax. You can get gas on reserves. You can live on reserves. It, there's a lot of really great benefits to being a uh, native status in Canada, but there's not really a lot of great, benefits to being actually native in Canada. And if you look at where indigenous and native people live, it's, there's no, I've never seen one where I would actually live because our government literally shits on our native population for the last, since time inception. If you look at the school, residential school thing that went down with the churches and everything else, it, it, indigenous people in Canada have always been shat on. That's just the way it is. Okay. And it's, it's interesting because the government makes trips over itself in certain ways. I think this happens in the U S too, where they're like, we have to do these native land recognitions and everything else, but it doesn't do anything for the native population at all whatsoever. None does nothing for them. That's kind of where I came from. That's who my mom was. That's who I found out who she was. And here's the thing. That's the craziest part about my mom. I didn't even know my mom's name was not Cheryl. It was Cindy. She was born Cindy Nash. If you look up any Nashes in the East Coast, it's very, very vast. There's a lot. Since done my ancestry and traits, I've found family members I had no idea existed in the hundreds. Hundreds. And I had a, I reached out to one of my aunts in Hamilton. She's like, I remember you when you were little. We miss you. We wonder how you're doing and everything else. I had so many great conversations. Okay. So that's where we are. I was born in Hamilton. Coming back to this whole thing. I hope this doesn't mess you guys up. So I was born in Hamilton. Okay. And... I honestly assumed that I just lived in Hamilton my whole life, okay? But after talking to some family members, it's not the case. So there's a space between when I'm born here in Hamilton and our first place that I have registered here in Google Maps, okay? So according to my family and friends that we lived with in the past, and here's the thing. As a child, the one thing I'm kind of starting to realize is that we never actually ever lived on our own. We always either lived with somebody because we didn't have anything. We were poor. And don't forget, my sister was born a year before I was. And so my mom had my sister and then had me, and then we would move around. And according to people that I can get a hold of that will tell me my story, this is the first place ever listed about where we lived. This is in Fredericton, New Brunswick, this house right here. And it's interesting because the person I talked to was like, I remember it like it was yesterday. I know the address. I know everywhere. And she sent me the Google pin. So we lived up in this upstairs apartment together with my mom and probably this other person. Okay. Interesting enough. This is when my mom weird. This is weird because, oh my God, I'm just having an epiphany right now because the next house we live in, it's interesting. I'm a lot of the stuff's going to unfold it with you, with you guys, but the space between Hamilton and here is likely around five or six years. So the first five or six years of my life, I don't remember the places that we lived. Nobody can tell me. My dad will not tell me. And I reached out to him. My dad has never been in my life. I remember seeing him when I was 13 years old. I stayed with him for a couple of weeks because my mom kind of pushed me out to go stay with him. She needed a break from me and I stayed with him. I did not like living with my dad. So I left. And the reason I say that is because I asked my dad about a specific memory. The first memory I have as a child. Okay. And again, trigger warning. First memory I have as a child, as far back as I can just pin my brain to, is my dad being arrested in our living room, okay? He was stabbed by my mom. 
And I remember that night very clearly because they had a big bay window in whatever apartment we were staying in, in Hamilton. Okay. And this huge bay window was there and the cop, the, the lights were on. It was, you can see the blue and I can see the blue and red so clearly. And I could see him being arrested and him apologizing to me when I was little. I remember that. I could have been three or four. I don't know when it was, but I found out later that, yeah, he, he, they got into a very heated argument. My mom has stabbed him to protect herself and us, and he was arrested. That's the first memory I have as a child. Before he was arrested, I remember watching the Thriller video on, M, on Much Music, and I remember being scared of the Michael Jackson Thriller video, but I loved Michael Jackson. I was a huge Michael Jackson fan. And so that is the first memory I have, and that is in Hamilton. And to this day... I have not been told where it is. Nobody can remember where it was, the place we lived, but it was obviously or it was obviously low income housing. Hamilton's full of it. But I also remember that house sleeping on a slab of foam and having western guns in a in a thing. So I also remember <laughs> this is funny cuz my sister and I were talking about this, the huge bags of puffed wheat because we didn't have any money. We were very very poor. Um very poor, as far as I remember, as far as my mom telling me too. And the only thing we could afford was powdered milk and puffed wheat for breakfast. And these bags of puffed wheat, as I remember them, probably because I was small, but these bags of puffed wheat were bigger than me. Like I'm telling you, in my memory, those bags of puffed wheat were humongous. Like, you know, those big bags of popcorn you get, like huge bags of cheesies and stuff. That's how I remember it. And so those are my earliest memories. My dad being arrested, eating puffed wheat and sleeping on a slab of, fa of foam in a empty bedroom with no toys. I do specifically remember that. Now, I don't, I don't consider it a bad memory. I don't have any triggering thoughts about it, but the arrest, I also don't feel like I had any triggering thoughts about it. I didn't understand because I was so young. So all that to say, that is my earliest memory. Then my second earliest memory is sticking a fork in an outlet and getting electrocuted. That I will never forget as long as I live. I was literally scared to plug a vacuum in until I was 12 years old. I was scared of plugs. Okay. So I remember that. But what I don't remember is after that, apparently we moved here. Okay. And then around the time my mom was 27 years old, she was living in Sussex, which will go because I lived there too. Living in Sussex, New Brunswick. And was friends with somebody who was her cousin that she didn't know about. And they all just, it all happened when they're like, oh my God, you are, you are Cindy. You are the one that was adopted. And my mom was like, as far as I'm aware, as far as from their account was flabbergasted and she wanted to meet her sister. And oddly enough, her sister, and so oddly enough, her sister here has been looking for her basically since she was 15 years old. And then they reconnected when she was 27 which means my mom was a little bit older, I think, or my mom was 27. That's what it was. And so she was a little younger. Interesting enough, they connected. And then my mom found out about her native heritage. And that sister was like, hey, did you know that we can get housing because we're native? And so this is where we moved next. I'm going to show you. We drove down the street across the bridge. Am I going the right way? Across the bridge, up this street here, all the way here. And I think it was, and then we moved here, which is just up the road a little bit. My mom was given this house through a native, I can't, I can't even pronounce the name, but it was a place that helped the native moms and single moms get into homes and help them pay their mortgage and everything else. It was a, it was a, if you were, if you were native, guys, I know that I'm saying native a lot and that's what I'm going to continue to say because that's what I grew up saying. Um, Aboriginal is probably the more preferred term, but I'm going to say native because I can say it. Okay. So my mom was part of this native group and her and her sister had houses side by side. What I've since found out is that my mom just left this house because the pipes burst and didn't want to fix it and just left. And then we ended up, I think, so as far as we're aware, we moved to Moncton and I want to say there might be a place, let me see if we can find it. So apparently we then moved to this place on the top floor in Moncton with a friend of my mom. And that friend has told me since that she remembers so vividly a young boy that I was. Because I always ask people when I first reach out to them, like, what's your first memory of me? And obviously, I was a young kid. I was, uh, I could show you pictures of me being young. And so, and I just wanted to show you this because it just came up. But this is a picture of my dad and my mom. And they were together, I think, on and off for the first four years of my life, in and out, in and out, in and out, fights and everything else. He was, as far as I'm aware, an alcoholic and a drug addict. And my mom was 
living, you know, was also living the same type of life. And that's the earliest picture and the only picture I have of them together, which was sent to me quite recently, actually. And just because I have it, here is a current photo of my biological father. And I'm sure you will see the resemblance for sure, right? And so I think part of the heritage of my European heritage comes from this side of the family, which is a very East Coast um, very large family. Uh, the place in Robinson Moncton, not even sure my family's not named after that or the town of not be named after that because my, my I'm a Robinson on my father's side, a Nash biologically on my mom's side, a barber adopted on my mom's side, right? I know it's crazy. You got to take some notes like Jess fam here. Okay. Um, I want to, I'm trying to find pictures of me was when I was a kid. And so here is an early is the earliest photo I think I have of my mom, my sister, and I. And as you could tell, handsome, right? Very handsome. <laughs> I, know. I make fun of people's kids. I was not a good looking kid. But that is a picture of us when we were really young. I have a few. And apparently a lot of my family members out in the East Coast have tons of photo albums with pictures of me. And I'm going to go head out there and going to go take a look at them. I'm very excited. I don't have any. Again, I, I only have photos of, ba of baby me from other people who knew me when I was young. We didn't grow up. We've moved so many times in my life that I don't, we didn't have anything. We often would move with a backpack or something and we would leave with nothing. We had nothing. And so my, growing up, we didn't have photo albums and things like that. Like a lot of people have and take for granted. Don't take for granted the memories of your childhood, everybody. Okay, please do that for me. After my mom left the housing she had from being a native, you know, being getting all those benefits from finding out she was native and everything else, she left and we moved here. Okay. I don't know why my mom kept moving. I don't know if what it was, but my aunt has some input and this is what I found out since she said that we have, and I don't know if this is even properly, you're allowed to say this, but Skigan El Noog, that's what it was called. We are gypsies. We are half black, half Indian native. That's what she says. And my Graham's father was an Indian chief. So this is what my aunt thinks that my mom was part gypsy. And she says that of all the people in our family that did all the things they did, my mom was the one who moved around the most. At current count, let me take a look here. So Hamilton, two, three, six, seven. Thirty-eight. 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44. Holy shit, I didn't even know that. Just by the count I just made for you right now, I have moved 44 times in my life. And I'm sure that's not even all of them, to be honest with you. I'm sure we couch surfed at one point. Don't forget I was homeless at one, at one point in my life, which I included as a move. Um, I have moved over 44 times in my life. And people would just be like, whoa. And I, so it doesn't even phase me if I have to leave or move somewhere, it's just normal for me. My boys um, probably have moved in their first 10 years of their life, minus our move since they came to us, was probably similar, like tw in the 20s, right? And so that's what happens with poor people. I honestly believe that. I think that poor people who don't have anything often don't have any roots. And that is one part of the perpetual, the cyclical version of, of being in poverty, is that you can never have any roots laid down generally. Not never, but we didn't. So all that to say, wow, I'm just surprised I, I just counted that. I've never counted them before. 44 is huge. So man, I'm getting, I know I'm getting a little long here. So from Robinson, I have again, no memories except for my dad being arrested in Hamilton. And this is after Hamilton. So I don't know why I have no memories of these places because the next memory I have is living with another couple, like another mom, a single mom who had two kids. And I remember one of those kids had Down syndrome. And she was really, 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 really nice, this mom. And she, I remember her buying me a big wheel. If you guys don't know what a big wheel is, it's this. And a big wheel, if you don't know in the 80s, was a big deal, okay? If you didn't have a big wheel, you were a loser. Big wheels were our way of getting around. It was just like you're part of the club. It, they, were, they could do e-brake turns on the dirt and they just had little rocks that got in the side. They were the shit. Okay. And I remember my mom couldn't afford one. And this lady came home. I can't remember her name. I don't remember at all, but I remember living there and I remember the back of the hill of the school. Again, I can, I don't know the address, but I'll show you where the school was. Okay. I remember the school very explicitly. Okay. And I remember we lived near this school in Hamilton, which is on the mountain as well, by the way. So you can see it here. Just living with this woman. Don't know why we lived with this woman, but I remember my mom telling me, this is another memory I have of being a really, really, really good reader. I could read at a very high level of, 
I don't know what you call it, a really high level of reading. By the time, I think, I think my teacher said by the time I was in grade four, which was at a school, I'll show you in a second, I was reading at 11th grade level. Like I was just voraciously reading everything and get my hands on. Remember, this is before internet, everybody. We didn't have shit. We would dumpster dive, play in the creek and crash into trees and shit like that and make forts and, and like do things we shouldn't have been doing, throw rocks, throw snowballs, steel, whatever, okay? This is way before we had Atari. I remember having an Atari, okay? So that's the next memory I have after the New Brunswick moves, okay? According to my family, we moved in, I was born in Hamilton, then I don't know where it happened after that. Fredericton, which the, the two houses I showed you, then Moncton, the show the home I showed you, I don't know how many. And then that person who said we lived in Moncton with them said we moved back to Hamilton, which I think is this house I'm telling you right now was a townhouse with, other, with another family group. But the, the memory I have of that place that stands out next to the big wheel is this. And again, trigger warning, okay? I remember being young and we had a big, I'm not sure if it was Thanksgiving or if it was just some big giant meal, could have been Christmas. I don't know what it was, okay? I think it was probably close to Thanksgiving because it was still warm outside. But I, my mom asked us, hey, who, do you need to go to the bathroom? And I probably said no. I specifically remember this moment because then halfway through dinner, I said, I have to go to the bathroom. And my mom, I don't know what got over her. She just said, no, you're not going to the bathroom. You eat, you stay there. You, you be polite, whatever. And I pissed my pants, literally pissed my pants at the, t at the dinner table. And I remember this so vividly, like it, I can remember it. It's so seared into my memory. And I don't know why my mom picking me up by my left arm and just smashing me like 20 times in front of everybody. Like I'm bawling my eyes out. She's smashing me. I can't, I don't remember what the people's reaction was at the party, but this was like the eighties. Okay. It's basically what people, they, 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 people beat their kids. That's what it was. And I'm not sure people were upset about it. I don't know. I do remember at one point somebody confronting my mom later in life about her hitting me in public. I'll, I'll tell you that in, in, in a couple minutes, but that was a, a memory I'll never forget. And then I was sent to my room and I, you know, I was just beat in front of people. So that's a memory I have of my childhood, right? I'm just getting beat. And a lot of people grew up getting beat, right? And so it's just, hey, that's normal. But I look back on my life and that's just not normal. I would never do that to my child. I would never embarrass them in front of people. I wouldn't embarrass myself like that in front of people. But that had to be, I don't know, it was crazy. So that is the other memory. Then things started kind of like solidifying into my memories. I remember leaving that place because my mom met my stepdad. Mike and my mom met my stepdad and I remember that because I remember the wedding and I remember being a dickhead to everybody and just like being a complete jack wagon because they would give me money to silence me and I would just clean up and I remember the gray shoes I had. I remember I had this little gray suit with a bow tie. It was really cute. It was tiny. I think there's a picture of me somewhere. I'm going to see if it's on my grandfather's obituary. I got to point this out too, but my mom, um, her funeral was packed. Okay. Packed. I was very surprised to be honest with you. Cause I did not know my mom had that kind of impact on the whole family. So I just want to show you some pictures of my mom's obituary page. Oh, here's a picture of my sister and I, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that existed. That's my sister and I, man, I was ugly. I was ugly. Sorry. Here's a picture of my mom, my sister and I, guys, I'm going to take my time with this video. So I don't really care if it's boring to you, but this is actually, I'm some, again, a lot of this I'm discovering with you. It's amazing picture of my mom. I think this is my mom's favorite picture of her. Lovely. In the 80s, this is what you did. <laughs> you remember these photos? Your mom, everybody's mom who's watching this has one of these photos, our dad. These, they take you to this, like, and they make it all, like, soft, and they give you, like, jewelry, and I don't know what they were called, but they all did this. Here is a picture of my mom when she was a teenager with the adopted grandma and grandpa, Grammy and Grampy Barber, and my mom was looking like she about 15 or 16 there. Oh, here's another picture of my sister and I. Man. Yeah. Here's a picture I actually remember having growing up in every house we had. My mom always had this picture framed. This is my sister. This is how old I was when my mom met my, my aunt. This is them reconnecting. So I was likely what, two or three there? So very interesting that that's between this time right here where you see this photo taken, I was living in Hamilton and that's my first memory of my dad being arrested. And that's, that's quite Okay, interesting. Look at how cute my sister is though, right? She's the cutest and I was ugly ass. I was an ugly ass. I had this ball though. I remember this ball. And I remember, <laughs> that's so funny. I had a matching soccer shorts and t-shirt and it was my favorite thing in the world and I, it was probably from Zellers. And I remember that 
I don't know why I remember certain things I remember, but that's interesting. That's Grampy. Grammy died a few years ago and Grampy just died recently. That's my mom in her 80s hair. And I remember that wedding very, 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 very close. And then the next place I remember moving to was here. I don't know if you guys knew this, but if you can go in a timeline on Google Earth and see the places back in the day, up to 2007, I think. So this is 2007. This is, this is the home that we lived in after my mom got married to my stepdad. Okay. And it looks a lot nicer than it did when we lived there. But I remember, I remember specifically, we lived on this half of the house. Okay. That was the entrance into the, where we went and we didn't have upstairs. We just had this floor only. Okay. <laughs> I have some memories inside of this house. Okay. First memory was moving in. And the first thing that my stepdad pulled off the moving truck, my big wheel. And I just fucking big wheeled around this whole neighborhood. You can't do that. Now you get kidnapped. Okay, but I remember that this house was not there at all. This is I'm surprised this house is still there. But I remember a couple of memories I have of this place. Uh, one is of my abuse, which I don't really want to get into. Um, but this is kind of where my abuse started. And it had a lot to do with not even necessarily inside my family, to be honest with you. Um, and I'll kind of leave that there just because I've, I've been thinking about that. Um but this is a big moment in my life that I don't even know if my sister knows. I don't even know if my mom ever knew. I don't think I ever told her. But I was essayed living at this house. And it wasn't by family. So that's a memory I have. Also have a memory of Christmas. I have a memory of watching Voltron, eating cereal. This was like, I have lots of memories from here. I remember um, being, uh, they had this pantry and I would sneak in the middle of the night and steal chocolate chips. <laughs> I also have a memory of I had a He-Man sword, okay? I don't know where I got it because my parents didn't get it for me. I probably found it at the playground or whatever, stole it from a friend. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night one night, and this sword was glowing, like glowing. I thought it was a ghost. I thought the ghost of He-Man was in my room. I've never forgotten that, but it was just a glow-in-the-dark sword now that I look back. I also have a memory, um, one of the earliest memories I have of my mom being, not nice isn't the wrong word, but being proud of me. Okay. Cause it was very, I mean, I don't have very many, but I remember running into the house here one day, I think it was a Saturday and I taught someone had taught me a magic trick and the magic trick is you hold two rocks together as hard as you can for like, and you, and then you, th I take a rock and I go around the hand and I count like 15 and then I say, pull the rocks apart really slowly and they'll be stuck together. And it, it feels like a magnet. It's just the way that it works. Right. And I remember specifically my mom like crying and hugging me for whatever reason, that moment has always stuck with me. And she's like, she was so proud of me. And I, again, imagine that for a second. Not having a lot of parental pride. And then the memories that you have are very, very few. I have very few memories of my mom ever being proud of me. There was a couple reading. She was really proud of my reading ability. And that moment right there up to this point, she was proud. But I remember also, I had a memory of this, walking up to school, walking up to the school here. So you take a left here at the street and you walk up to the school. I remember walking home from school one day and it was a lightning storm. And I kid you not, lightning struck in the exact shape of a skeleton, like a skull. It was a skull. I don't care what anybody says. It was a skull. I'll never forget it. Okay. So that's what kind of happened here. This was a place of, they were newlyweds, my mom and my stepfather. And also where other abuse started, not my story to tell. But uh, this was not, you know, it's, it's, it's odd because my mom, up to that point, we were, we were very poor. And then she met the stepdad and he had a good job, right? And so we didn't have to worry about money after this point. Not really. I mean, we were still not wealthy, but we weren't, we had a vehicle, which was something we never had before. And this was a parking lot before it was a fence here. And we, there was a job and we had to grow. We would never, we never went hungry after this moment, right? There was never any moments here that we were hungry, except I do have one memory. Sorry, I know it's taking so long. Um, I do have a memory of going to the school and the school had a breakfast program. If you know anything about breakfast programs, especially in Canada, is what they do is they tell kids, if you don't get breakfast at home, you're welcome to come a little early and we will feed you breakfast. Because we like, look at where we are. It's like the poorest neighborhood. And don't forget, back then it wasn't gentrified like it is right now. This is gentrified. This was, we were poor. Everybody was poor. Okay. And the school would feed us breakfast. And I just like, I want some damn free breakfast, even though I didn't need it. And I remember my mom having to come to the school 
and being like, why are you telling these people you don't have breakfast at home? Like we, you guys could be taken away from us. C- C- CPS could be called. And I was like, I don't know. I just want a free breakfast. But the school, they would use these programs to call CPS on parents, which, you know, looking back, I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm not saying I don't do, I agree with it. But at the same time, I mean, I'm so, that was a moment that CPS opened a file on us, is basically what I'm saying. Even before that, we had so many more different things happen to us and nothing happened. But that was just a moment that I remember specifically my mom saying, and she wasn't mad. She was just like, you can't do that because that's for kids who actually need food. So that's a memory. Okay, after this, we moved to probably one of my best childhood memory places ever. From that place, I guess my stepdad was making a little bit more money. I think he had gotten a job with the government. So this building is where we lived next. And I have a lot of great memories from this childhood part of my life because we were no longer poor. I actually had two vehicles, one in the underground parking garage, and we had one over here. We had a truck. Okay, that was a big deal when you're poor. Having a vehicle when your whole life you've never had a vehicle, you walked everywhere. I had a specific memory of my childhood taking a bus to the dentist's office and a bus driver making me a Canadian flag and giving it to me. That's, again, we walked everywhere. My whole childhood was us walking everywhere. My mom took us everywhere. Okay, but this is where we lived. And we lived on the fourth floor and I remember, uh, it was a decent apartment. It was a three bedroom apartment. And my parents at one point were actually the building managers. At one point, my mom would cut the grass, clean the places, and she would be a building superintendent, I guess you call it. And, uh, that was pretty cool. So this is where we lived. And this is where I did all the dumpster diving. I'll show you where, if I can go over it. This is really cool. I'm not gonna lie. It's getting me some childhood memories. Okay. So here's. Here's the playground in the back where we had, and this tree right here is where I had my first dudes only fort. Like we had laminated cards with saran wrap. We, you know, we climbed trees and everything else. And if you go over here, you can't really see it, but this building, I think this has been changed, but this is all fenced around. The garbage used to be here. Okay, this is must be fixed. But there used to be big bin here before all the garbages were here. And this is where we would dumpster dive. And back here, nobody maybe to this day is still there. There's this pathway that's only like kids can get to full of Playboy magazines and like shit that we found and like all these treasures and garbage and needles and shit. We would hide there. This is where we'd play hide and seek. It was a, they had a playground, which is gone now. Um, and this is, again, this is where we were. I remember, here's another memory. Walking down the street with mom here, and I'll show you another memory of this exact spot, and I found a $100 bill. My mom told me this later in life. I found a $100 bill, and my mom traded it for a dime. I took the dime. Yeah, not very smart. And uh, she laughed about that later in life. But here is where I got hit by a car as well. So here is what we were doing. Across the street, there was a store. It looks like it's not there anymore, but there was a store here. And we would go there to buy all our penny candies and stuff like that. And there was a bank here, not there any longer. Um, But what we would do, because we were stupid, is we would get to this point of the road and we would run as fast as we could across the street here, like as fast as we could, even if cars were this close, because we thought we were speedy. That's where I get hit by a drunk driver. This lady hit me so hard. I flew. I remember this under this hill right here. I hit this hill really hard and I was blacked out. The next memory I had was an ambulance picking me up and my neighbor coming over and picking me up and bringing me home. They didn't want me to get taken by the ambulance. I don't know. My mom was at work. Remember, I was, I think, 11. I was 11. We didn't have any parents home when we were 11. The rule of the 80s and 90s were if you were at home by yourself and you were too young to be home by yourself, you don't answer the door. If anybody calls, you don't answer the phone. If you do answer the phone and say, where's your parents? You say, they're in the bathroom. There was the rules. You just didn't answer. So, and again, I'm not saying that this was this was good or bad. I'm just saying, this is how it was when I was young. And I think a lot of you would be like, you're shaking your head. You're like, that's exactly what it was. You sometimes be home when you're like nine years old, you can watch whatever you want, but don't answer the door and don't say anything until I get home. But anyway, I remember being, my mom had to come home from work from wherever she was working. I think she was working at a hotel and she got so angry at me because I was an idiot. This fence was never there by the way. And I remember that's a memory. Also a memory I have is going to uh, Eastgate mall across the street here. Let's go. Let's take a little trip. Eastgate Mall. Okay. This shitty ass mall. We would go to this mall. And we would go to the fountain. Oh, the 3D. We would go to the fountain. No, is this not the Eastgate? This is Eastgate Mall. Eastgate Mall is right here. It had a Zellers. It had all the cool stuff. Now it doesn't have any of that stuff. But uh, we would go here and we would steal money out of the fountain. (laughs) 
<laughs> we got in trouble all the time. We'd also go to the grocery store, which I think is Fortino's. Oh, it's still there. Yeah, this Fortino's is still there. And they would have free coffee. And we would put like 18 sugars and just drink free coffee. It was terrible. Again, we were just nomads rolling around. So that was where we moved next. Also interesting was a school that I went to. Okay, here we are. So interesting enough, here's some couple more memories. Again, this is about my life. So if you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. But this is this is really interesting to me. So we lived in this apartment building. We would take a walk down Irene Avenue in the morning for school. We didn't get bust. Or if you were, you know, whatever, you're brave, you would go down past this thing over here, down this little hill, and take the creekway all the way up to Green Acres School, which is right here, I think. Is that Green Acres? Yes, there it is. Otherwise, you'd walk up Irene. Okay, you take a left and then right on Vivian and you would go down this little path and this little path will take you to school. Okay, this little path, this little downhill right to the school. This school is where I had one of the most horrific moments of my life. There was a girl, her name was Julie Brown. Julie Brown was rich. Julie Brown was really nice to everybody. Her mom served at the school. Julie Brown was very pretty. She was really nice and I had a massive crush on Julie Brown, okay? And a girl named Heidi Belmer. I had two crushes. I remember, <laughs> and don't forget, again, this is a place, I, I, we, didn't, we weren't wealthy at any, at any stretch. We always still wore hand-me-downs, shitty shoes. We weren't really rich at all. But I remember being playing on this playground, which apparently is gone now, and a bunch of gaggle of these little girls came up, and they were like, we have a secret for you. Julie Brown wants to know if you'll be her boyfriend. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Yes! And I was so excited. And then they ran back to Julie Brown and their little friend group. And then I went over and they're like, we're just kidding, loser. <laughs> oh my God. And it was uh, a moment in my life where I, uh, I'll, never, I'll never get back. I was heartbroken, devastated, just crazy. But at the same time, again, it was just something that happened when you were kids. And we ended up being friends later, actually. All of us kind of grew up in, for a couple years that we did live here. Um, but this school was pretty cool. I had a teacher named Mrs. Pop. She was really hot, as far as I'm aware, in grade three. And then I had a teacher named Mr. Spitzer, who was a dick face, who threw me in a pool at Julie's end of the year school party, and I didn't know how to swim. And I almost drowned. He had to come in and save my life. I almost got drowned by my teacher. I can't believe I'm just thinking these things now. It's crazy. So he was a wiener. I hated that guy. But I always remember he had these, he always wore these nice shirts, and he had those things that you put on your sleeves, like poker. I don't know. You see them in old movies, but this like thing that went around that held up his sleeve or something. I remember that he was a young guy too. And I remember him bawling his eyes out at the, at the end of the school year because it was his first year teaching and he was just bawling his eyes out. I remember that. And then he almost drowned me. But oddly enough, the Green Acres outdoor pool is still there. And this is the pool that's been re revamped since I've been there. It was never looked like this. It was just one big rectangle. That's where I learned swim. I remember I took swimming lessons all summer and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And then the last day of swimming lessons, I failed. And then I went swimming the next day and I taught myself, I just did it. I just went and did it. I always considered myself a late bloomer. I was always late at learning things and catching on. Same with school, same with math, except for reading. I was really good at reading and I was really good at running. I could run like the wind when I was young. And I was really, really thin, really, really, really skinny kid because we just Again, we didn't have a lot of food. And I do believe that my childhood and the fact that we were never allowed to eat whatever we wanted um, or never got anything, we were always told no. If you ever went to my mom ever when we were young and said, mom, can I? She, before you even got the thing out, she was no. We were never, ever told, yeah, let's think about it. It was always like, no, f off, basically, was what it was my whole life. Um, I do believe that my, my weight gain that happened after the divorce, which we'll get to, was because of food insecurity. Big time. Like uh, for all of a sudden I was able to eat whatever I wanted because no one was watching me and I was abandoned and I got really, 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 really fat, like really fat. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. So that's the school I went to. That was my memories as a childhood. I remember, let's see if we can go back to my building. Okay. So this building, we would ride my bike over to, I want to say there's a hill somewhere over here. Is it over here? Yeah, here it is. Okay. There's this hill right here. You can't really see it, but the path starts right here. Okay. Down this path, is this big ass tree. Okay. But this is a huge hill. I don't know if you can see, I don't know if you can see that from this level. I don't know if you can, but there's a massive hill here. And I went down on a tricycle and I smashed my face into that tree. I couldn't stop. I went face first into that tree at full speed, came home. My chin was bleeding everywhere. I had a big gash. My mom flipped. 
I didn't, I think I got, I don't, I don't have no scars from it though. I have a scar up here on my eyebrow from something, but I have no scar from that. I remember that. Um, I also remember playing baseball in the back of this apartment and hitting a kid in the face with a baseball bat by accident because I overswung and then we all just ran away. <laughs> Are you kids? You didn't, you didn't mean to do it, but we hit this. I hit this kid in the head so hard with a baseball bat by accident. And again, what kids do is they just look and they just all run away. They don't know how to deal with it, but he was fine. I think. Yeah, he was fine. Yeah, we were friends. So there, we lived there from grade three to grade six. Okay, man, should I keep going? I don't know. I feel like, if, if, do I have any traumatic memories from this moment in my life? Not really. See, this is the point in my life where mom was newly married to my stepdad. He had a good job. We had food. Um, we would take trips, not like vacations, but we would, you know, go to Niagara Falls or we'd go to his parents in Grimsby, which was really nice. We just had a normal child at this point. This was the most normal life I have ever had, even though during this time, and I've asked my sister this, if I can say that, even though, you know, it's not my, I won't tell you the story, story. Even though during this time, there was actually traumatic events going on inside my family that I didn't know about, my mom didn't know about. That's all I'll say. And so it was though, however, the most normal ever. I remember finding 20 bucks in the parking lot one time over at uh, over here with my sister and my mom and I picked it up behind my mom. My sister said, if you don't give me half that, I'm telling mom. I had to give her half. And then we went over to here, which was, um, this was a 7-Eleven here that the shell and we just, I spent it entirely on candy. The whole thing. I remember that. But yeah, this was the most normal and the most happy I've ever been as a child. Even though also there was a lot of traumatic kids, I'm going to say that, living in these types of environments. Um, I had my first girlfriend here. My first kiss was here. Um, I remember a girl doing something to me outside of the fence behind the fort here. Not not like I wasn't SA, but we were the same age and she was things... I'm like not sex or anything, but like show me your things kind of thing. The things that went on in low income areas growing up, you would be flabbergasted at the things. And I think I look back on it now and my past history of SA. And I think a lot of that had to do with a lot of these kids were SA. A lot of these kids were abused and that was normal for them. Right. Really, 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 really interesting. And the world doesn't want to talk about that. Right. Okay. So we live there. Very normal childhood. Very, very happy. And then we move to what I consider to this day, even to this day, even though it's not really, because it's not the longest place I've ever lived. We moved to a place called Juniper Court. And so we moved to this house here in Juniper Court in Beamsville. And this for us, especially my sister and I, growing up very poor was a literal mansion. Okay, this is unlike anything we'd ever been a part of, lived in, whatever. It was beautiful street in a beautiful little town called Beamsville, which honestly... I might in, end up back here someday in my life. Maybe. I really, really loved Beamsville. But this is when my little brother was born. Okay. And I forgot to mention about my little sister, Christina, and I should go back. But my little, uh, that between that point where my mom's left that house and moved to Hamilton, there's a, or, and moved to, to, to Moncton. So she left the house because all the, because all the pipes burst from being frozen and moved to Moncton. My little sister was born. I did not meet my little sister until I was 12 years old. And so we didn't even know about her until we were, I was a well into my teenagehood. And so she was born and adopted into my bio family, the Nashes. So just, that's a story. Then my little brother was born in this house. And I really remember it. It was a really, really proud, happy moment for everybody. We were very well off, two cars, not well off, but um, working for the government is a pretty big deal here. So we were making good money. My mom was working at a hotel. She was working either as a waitress. My mom was always working, always. And so we were doing okay. We never really went on any big vacations, but our Christmases were piled high and we just didn't have to worry about anything anymore. So that's this house here. Really regret memories. My backyard neighbor, Perry. I remember this guy. Perry's a funny guy. And we got into all sorts of shit. So the memories from this house are really crazy. But those memories really didn't pick up until the divorce. So this is also the place where my parents got divorced. Mike considered him my dad because he was with us since I was eight till I was about 13. And um, I remember the school I went to, the teacher here also didn't like me. Mr. What was his name? Mr. Mr. Wilson, that asshole is probably dead. Now that guy bullied me in school. I remember specifically, I had a, sh a pair of shoes. They were called winners. Let's see if I can look them up for you. Okay. Amazing. I found it. Okay. So when I was young, I always wanted a pair of Nikes 
and everybody wore the Andre Agassi Air Nikes, and I obviously would never get it. We were so, my parents just didn't, they didn't want to get us that shit. But my mom would buy me shoes like this that looked like Nikes, and they were called Winners. Winner. Okay, and this is the exact pair that I had. I'm so surprised I found this. And I could buy it on eBay or Poshmark for $16. These were what I wore and had a little bubble, I remember. And my teacher, Mr. Wilson, because everybody hated me because I was, I just, I was, I guess I was hyperactive and I was the loser and everything else. But he would, he would make fun of me. And then one day he called me, hey, Josh, you're a real winner with your shoes. And I remember that specifically. Like everybody laughed at me in class. Imagine a teacher in grade six bullying a child like that. It's weird because I, there's a lot of, hurt I have from teachers, but I have some good memories too, but I have a lot of hurt from teachers too. Growing up poor, especially being poor in like a, a, a wealthy ish type of neighborhood. Teachers were dick bags, man. And probably still are, but I have some really good memories of teacher coming up soon. Anyway, so more memories of this place. So I lived here. Um, there was train tracks, there was cherry. So I talked about growing up in the, in the area of all the, uh, Fruit in Ontario. So Ontario's fruit orchards. Look at this. I just need to zoom out just quickly for you guys. I need you to see this. What you see here are vineyards, fruit trees, apple trees, pear trees, cherries, you name it. This is on, this is Beamsville. Everything you see in this, this thing here is where all of, not all, but most of the fruit and veggies that you eat in Ontario when it's out fresh comes from this town. And so we would go, and so we would go to neighborhoods into these farmer fields and just pound cherries. For example, I can tell you which, which tree is what now these are vin, these are vineyards, a lot of vineyards in Beamsville as well. So if you drove up green lane, so this is a cherry tree. You can pick a cherry tree apart by its bark. Okay. It's really, really th- th- dark brown and shiny. And that, and it's very wide like that. And so we would go into farmer's fields and just pound cherries. And if you didn't know this, cherries are a natural laxative. So we'd have to run because we'd eat like a thousand cherries. We'd have to run home so fast because we had to shit so bad. I would never forget that ever. Okay. So coming back to Juniper Court, this is where my parents got divorced. Okay. Um, I don't know what the reason was. I do have a memory of coming home and first time ever seeing my stepdad crying ever. Just crying his eyes out on the couch, smoking a cigarette and smoked back in the day and saying, you know, we're getting a divorce and you won't see me anymore, all this kind of stuff. And I was like bawling my eyes out. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I'm pretty sure to this day, I think what I've gathered is that my mom did cheat on him um, and just wanted to, you know, live a life of nomad again. She didn't want to be there anymore. They were fighting uh, again. They, there were some memories I have that were really, really inappropriate with these two. He's a deviant. And I remember going to family, a friend of theirs house, and they had kids our age and we would be there till late. And I remember walking into the room and they were all watching porn, like just weird. And this is the eighties too. You go into the, um, any man's garage in the eighties and there's a poster of naked ladies up on the wall and like a calendar of all the playboy bunnies and stuff. That was just normal. I remember going into my mom's room. I remember my mom's room, even in the other building, there was a, just this, this big boobied lady with a fishnet on in a poster in their room. It was so, I look back and it was so weird. I would never ever expose my children to pornography ever. And back in the day, that was just normal. So yeah, divorce happens. Okay. And so up to this point, I was the happiest kid on earth. Lots of cool friends, bikes. We would, we were very busy. Beamsville was a great place to grow up and have fun and just be safe. Um, and everything else. Right. But that divorce happened. And then as soon as the divorce happened, my mom kind of went off the rails and I think I'm actually going to leave that there for now because we are a little bit into this story. Um, but this is the point of my life where everything fell apart. I know there was some stuff before, before my mom got married. And then before we had a, a, a little bit of normalcy from the point I was about seven to 13, but before I don't really have a ton of memories of the trauma, but what comes after this story is where everything gets really, really crazy and also kind of guides where I'm going to be in my life for the next bunch of years, the church and everything that's kind of happened in here. It gets really, really crazy. I don't know. Has that been really helpful to you guys? I don't know. I do want to say this before I end this video, though. My mom grew up um, very, very well off in a really normalized household until she was 16. And then she left. And the things I've learned about my mom since then are that she was a nomad, just like I was, just like my, just like everybody in my family was. Um, that she has four different children from four different fathers. And she just was never comfortable just living a normal life. If she ever got comfortable, 
for whatever reason, it would freak her out and she would upend it. And she had a lot of trauma from her past, lots that I don't know about, lots that I'll never know about. And it really defined who she was. And if there is gypsy in our family, if, if, if my aunt is correct, it does make a little bit of sense. But the generational trauma was passed down to my sister and I 100%. And we will get to that in the next video. But again, I don't want these videos to be a big bash fest of my mother, right? There is going to be some reckoning. There is going to be some truth told, but I need to let you know before we move on to the next video, when we keep talking about this, she is a main player in my life. Okay. My mom is somebody that I think hung the moon. Doesn't matter how she treated me later in life. I did recognize it afterwards, but there's no moment here in my life that I thought that I hated her or anything like that. I did get beat a lot. I got the fly swatter. I did get the spoon. My mom did hit us a lot and grounded us a lot. And we were, you know, we were lived in a very strict household, like to the, to the minuscule amount that we ate and everything else. It was very, very, very controlled. Not in a way that she's controlling us for her, her own benefit or our own benefit, but just because she wanted to be mean because that's, I don't know why, because she wasn't, she was raised in a very loving family. So I want to say that it's not gonna be a bash fest on my mom. And I'm not trying to get you guys to feel sorry for me, but I, you know, it's my story. And so I, when it comes to the probably part three or four, when I talk about my mom and I having our a redemption moment, you, I think you're going to be, I think you're going to cry. I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> There's a lot that comes after this story right here up to, up to this point in Beamsville that uh, everything kind of shifts. And um, so I'll leave that here. I'll leave that at this moment where I was really, 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 really happy until the divorce. Okay. Whew. We're getting there. I know I, I might be a little bit long winded, but I'm actually remembering things as I go along with you too. So really cool. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Leave a comment below what you think, what stood out to you the most. Do you guys have similar memories like that to me? Was I overreacting about the abuse? Cause everybody got beat when they were kids. Did you get beat? I don't know. Um, interesting. What, what stood out to you the most? Do you, does it, do you see anything kind of creating a pattern in me or anything like that? I, I see the pattern of me moving all the time and not caring for sure. And realizing that I've moved 44 times, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So, wow. Thank you for being here for the story. Sorry it took me a little too long to get going on it, but uh, I wanted to do, 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 I wanted to do it right. I really wanted to do it right just for me and for my kids too. I want my kids to be able to watch this. This is really interesting to me because I have so many unearthed memories that are coming forward and I'm glad I'm doing it. I really am. And I'm glad you're here for it. Don't forget your value and your worth. And I will see you tomorrow.